Welcome to Elevate Her. I am super excited to have you on the podcast today. And so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the people, let us know a little bit about yourself, uh, and then we'll kick off from there. Sure, Susanna. Thank you so much for having me. It is just uh, a pleasure and a blessing to be here with you today on Elevate Her. Um, I definitely am one who believes in um, the elevation and uplifting of women in, in personal and professional spaces. So it is, thank you for the invitation. I, I thank you and I appreciate you. So a little bit about me. Um, I have been, um, I'll start on the professional side. Um, I have been within the field of higher education for 25 years. I have come up on a quarter of a century and I can't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> I'd love to say I started when I was 12, but that would be a lie. Well, um, you're 21 plus shipping and handling. my. Life, so <laughs> so uh, I have worked in the uh, university uh, sector. So at research universities, I have worked in the private sector of uh, private uh, comprehensive uh, with a touch of liberal arts institutions. And okay. now I am working in the community college sector. And so I have a breadth uh, and an increasing depth of knowledge mm -hmm. uh, across the sectors within the industry of higher education. Um, I am uh, currently the vice president for advancement and external affairs. And um, I previously was a vice president for student development, uh, otherwise okay. known as student affairs with okay. a touch of student success within it, meaning I was responsible for retention and persistence in initiatives. And prior to that, I was a chief diversity officer. So again, sort of a breadth yeah. of, yeah, of experiences um, and uh, I really feel blessed and honored to have served in those different capacities because it brings a unique lens to campus from, from various angles. And uh, I've supervised staffs of one to 90. Um, wow. So yeah. so you so know your been, stuff is pretty much what you're telling me. <laughs> it's been a range, it's been a, it's been, um, it's been a fulfilling career and I'm not done yet. Yes. So, but I am thinking about legacy. I probably have about 10 more years. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, you know, right. about legacy now. Yeah. Um, I am a wife and uh I I'd like to say um mom of three, wife of one. Okay. And um <laughs> <laughs> I have an amazing adult daughter and I have two teenage sons, uh junior and senior in high school so I am doing okay. the college search myself and awesome. so I get to be on the other side of the, this journey yeah um, so yeah. I'm active in my community um uh, I do service um I'm active in my church I'm um, a woman of faith and um you know that that is I coach I consult, I write, I blog, I write for higheredjobs.com. Okay. And um, it's a great publication. I've yeah. done their podcast before too. It's great people who, who really believe in um, the work and providing employment access and opportunities for all. So that is shout awesome. out to Higher Ed Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So I'd love for you to kind of share with us what drew you to higher education um, mm -hmm. to serve in these types of capacities. Sure. So it was actually um, my experience in higher education, primarily as a transfer student transferring mm. into my um, undergraduate alma mater of the University of Albany, SUNY. And um, I was sort of a not, I was a non-traditional transfer student in that I was only slightly older than a traditional student, but I was a mom. I was a single mom. Mm. And so who relocated three hours from three hours away, I grew, was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and I transitioned to to university. And um, I remember my mother saying to me when I came to her and I said this, made this 
big pronouncement. Oh, um, by the way, I'm going away to school. I applied to the university at Albany. I got accepted and I'm taking my seven year old with me. Wow. And she said, what? Like, <laughs> we don't even know anyone in Albany. And she said, right. you know, that is upstate. I said, yeah. well, no, actually, it's really central New York. But, you know, for Brooklynites, yep. Westchester is the North Country. Yes, ma'am. So, <laughs> yes, so, ma'am. <laughs> she thought out. But I did it. I relocated. And I had such a challenge. I mean, great people. I, I mean... I, I met so many wonderful administrators and faculty, but in my transition to college, there was really no one there to help a non-traditional student like myself to find mm -hmm. off-campus housing and a good school district. And I was struggling in a lot of different ways. Okay. And um, but I was resilient. So I made it. I was resilient, and I was determined. So I came and I made it and I found a a school for my daughter and and she went to school and I went to school and we found a way to to survive um yeah. and but during this time period i i i found i came into an environment where environment like most transfer students where friendships were already established yes and as a transfer student who had evening obligations i couldn't necessarily hang out and do some of the other things so i found a home in the admissions office <laughs> sitting on the sofa <laughs> Talking to the admissions counselors who probably should have been working at the time instead of, you know, conversing with this, you know, <laughs> curious undergraduate. And I, you know, and so the GAs and the, you know, um, I was a work study student in the financial aid office. So I um I got interested in higher ed at that time mm -hmm. because um I was floating around after I graduated trying to think about what kind of career I would do after graduation. I, I did two years in retail management and I said, you know, I like dresses, dresses are important, but there's gotta be more to life than dresses. So I need to find yeah. a new thing. And so <laughs> right. <laughs> went back, got my master's degree and then launched my career in residence life um, in student affairs at the University at Albany, my alma mater. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, so we have a lot of similarities. Um, I fell in love with higher education through residence life. I started off as an <laughs> RA um, and then kind of transitioned out of it for a little while and then came right back because I loved student affairs. Uh, my dream was to be a director of student activities because to me, that's where you had the most fun. <laughs> And like, I couldn't wrap my head around how you could enjoy do like how you could have so much fun at work. Uh, so I, I love that we have those commonalities um, in that background. And so coming from Brooklyn mm -hmm. to the University at Albany, I am mm -hmm. sure that it was huge culture shock for you. It Can was. you share a little bit about that? Oh, girl. Um, <laughs> well, let's just say this. Uh, geography was not my best subject because when I relocated up here, I actually rented an apartment about an hour away from campus. Wow. And in the country. Like, <laughs> I mean, it just so happened that my mother went into her phone book and found the only people we knew <laughs> in, like, near Albany in another, it was a, a couple from our neighborhood who relocate her, you know, who relocated up here and they lived in a town called Greenville and anybody okay. watching this be familiar. I mean, it's cow country. And so, <laughs> my, but my mother was like, well, if you're going to do this, I would feel a lot more comfortable if you were at least rented an apartment with someone that we know. Yeah. And so yeah, I yeah. did, I moved in and I had this little beat up little car and um, that was a little sporty kind of car. I brought it for like a thousand dollars, like right before I moved, uh, made this move upstate. And because in this city, you know, we, we never we took buses and trains. We never dealt with cars. So right. I brought my little my little beat up car, and I think I killed that car, like driving back and forth to school, you know. And so you want to talk culture shock? And oh, dare I also mention that we were the only black people in the entire town okay. at that time now I don't know how diverse Greenville may have become but back then and so I went from this very urban very diverse 
open all night, you know, Mm -hmm. city environment to this town where, you know, you better get to the supermarket by eight o'clock or you just going to, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Oh, man. So, so yeah. So, um, yeah, it was culture shock, but you know what? It was what I wanted and it was what I needed. Um, eventually I moved closer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I did. I was, I was like, I, I love you people, but this, you're way too far out. Like, so yeah. I, I could also know. imagine the weather up there. The snow was probably oh, yeah. hot and oh, heavy yeah. at times. Oh, oh yeah. It, yeah, it was, it was. And the deer. Oh my God. I never saw a deer in Brooklyn. Well, that's so, true. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, imagine my surprise when I'm driving on sl- snowy roads and there's deer. So yeah, uh, but you know, I I wanted something different. I mean, I left the city because I had a lot of I had some some false starts. I started mm-hmm. college at sixteen, uh, and quickly failed out at eighteen. Mm. Um, and then I restarted at community college after like a little break, right? And um, that's where I found my 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 footing. Right. And then I said, okay, now I'm ready to get back into this. Now I could be a serious student. I needed to fail. And yeah. um, so I failed forward. And then, Ooh. but when I, when I got through successfully and proved to myself after that one solid semester in community college, I went to Birmingham Community College. After that one term, I, I said, okay, I got to get out of the city. I'm too distracted. Yeah. You know? Yeah. For me, for me, um, there were too many distractions. So. Mm-hmm. Greenville uh, was what I needed. Yeah. <laughs> it's what for me to do my homework. Yes. But... Playing spades in the cafeteria with my friends. I just, I had to <laughs> girl after my own heart. So I love that you said a fail, failing forward. And I think that that is something that as we go through our trajectory in not only education, but also like in our professional field, um, I think that so many people shy away from failing forward. Mm -hmm. And so could you share a little bit about how, how you can make those moments where you feel like you're failing, but reframe them to be able to see the value within that. Because you mentioned I needed Greenville at that time. And so that sounds to me like there was a bit of reframing that needed to happen in order for you to be able to get to this place um, where you're at. Because I don't, at least for me, I don't think anyone wakes up and they're like, yay, I'm going to work in higher education, especially coming from the city. We're just like... (laughs) Oh, we we kind of like fall in love as we go through it. So I'd love to hear your take on that. Well, I guess the uh, I, that's not the failing forward um, was something I learned as an adult. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I learned to contextualize it as an adult. But my my early life was actually full of what some might call failures. So. Um, so I had to build resilience early because these failures came with major consequences. Mm-hmm. So I had to learn how to reframe my failures. Um, first of all, I was pregnant at 13 and had a baby at 14. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the seven-year-old that I brought to college with me. Right. So I had to learn. And, and, and that when you're 14 and pregnant, you know, you pretty much, you lose your, your friends. If you're in Catholic school, you lose your schoolmates because I had to, then at the time, you know, you couldn't be pregnant in Catholic school. So I had to leave. And then, uh, while I was pregnant, um, but gratefully return after I delivered my baby. So I lost, uh, if you're active and involved in a, in a, in a religious congregation, Mm-hmm. And for me, it was very conservative. So I lost my church family. There were a lot of losses at the age of 14. Wow. So I had to learn resilience at a, at a young age. And I know that there are many women out, you know, out there and people out there who have had, if not similar stories, have had stories of loss that yeah. had, had them help need, develop the need to build resiliency. So you you learn without even knowing Mm. The the saying that says there are no losses, only lessons. Mm. And 
Um, I learned that when my children started to get involved in sports and, mm. and one of their best coaches said that, you know, no losses, just lessons. Yeah. And, and that reframing, I think, and that, that quote kind of just stayed with me like, and, and gave definition to what had been occurring most of my life, whether it was from um, um, the loss that occurred um, through having a, a, a child young and making that, that choice and decision. And then the, the failing out of school and, 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 and everything else that came after that. And there were right. many things because the losses didn't stop. You know, when I hit the age of 21, the, the losses continued, but in different ways. Um, so I, I think that forward uh, momentum or that forward outlook is something that um, um, you learn from resiliency. And some people learn it young and some people learn it in the workforce at an older, <laughs> you know, yeah, when they're yeah. older. Not everybody, you know, it's hard. Let me tell you, I'm telling you, I've seen people struggle who got their first supervisory role at 35 or 40. Yeah. Um, uh, the, a lot of the supervision mistakes I made, I made at 25, 28, 30. So that by the time I got to 35, 40, I had that better sense of, if not who I was as a person, mm -hmm. completely who I was as a supervisor. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is so key when it comes to leadership in any kind of field is really understanding yourself mm -hmm. and understanding what your core values are, what your core um, beliefs are, understanding mm -hmm. your personal mission, your mm -hmm. personal brand, so that you can be able to articulate that to a team to be able to accomplish a vision mm -hmm. um because i really do believe that teams they will they'll buy into the person before they buy into the vision or the goal and so as as women that are within these higher ed roles um mm -hmm. i'd love for you to kind of share what what are some of your successes within leadership, right? And then what are some of the blind spots that, that women should pay attention to in order to be effective? Well, you know, I love what you said about self-awareness um, being directly tied to successful leadership. Um, and I think that oftentimes we don't take the time to build that self-awareness where, where situationally awareness Mm -hmm. We're other centered, you know, aware where we work to build awareness. Right. Um, and sometimes our responses to people or situations are based on how we feel we should show up in that situation based on a reflection mm -hmm. of what's being given back to us from that situation or from that person. Um, as to as, as opposed to stopping and saying, wait a minute, who who do who not who do I need to be in this situation, but who am I first yeah. and foremost? Yeah. And then it's how do I show up yes. in this situation? Yes. Um, and, and I think that when we talk about authentic leadership, <clears throat> you know, it starts with that sense of, of, of building a self-awareness. So part of what I do when I, um, I call myself a life strategist. So, you know, life coach, mm -hmm. life strategist. One of the things I do when I work with uh, executive women um, for women in general, you know, um, my brand logo is purpose positioning where I help individuals learn themselves, love themselves so that they can be themselves unapologetically. Ooh, I love that. Can you say <laughs> it again, please? <laughs> <laughs> so what purpose positioning is, is to help individuals learn themselves so that they can love themselves so that they can be themselves unapologetically mm, so good so what does that mean when we talk about being unapologetic does that mean that I just show up as I am and I don't care what people think mm -hmm. um and I don't care who I hurt I don't care no that's not you know that that framing of unapologetic can some come across as um um I'm just going to be me at all costs to anyone um, and that's not what I what I mean when I say that. I mean that you've taken the time to build this self-awareness 
Right. That you've taken the time to sit with yourself, learn who you are, begin to just love on that person, know that yeah. person, know her, love her. And then gradually you'll find that you are able to actually show up as who she really is, as opposed to a reflection of what others are asking her to be at that moment. Yes. And, and not being sorry even if it means some losses, because sometimes you may have to show up authentically and unapologetically Mm -hmm. in disagreement with the norm or the conversation that is happening around you. Yeah. And so how do you, you know, get, get to a space of I've weighed the cost. Um, even if it's a quick one, you know, I've, 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 and I've, I've determined, I've done a quick cost benefit analysis mm-hmm. and I've determined that in this situation, it's most important for me to be true to who I am with my core values, which are other centered in that I'm showing up, not just here, not just to add my voice to this, to this discussion, but to advocate for someone other than me. Yeah, you know, through this work that I'm doing. Because a lot of us go into this work because we believe in students and we want to see students succeed. And we all play a role in that, whether we're fun, Absolutely. right? Or whether we're planning activities, whether we're creating a home away from home in the residence halls. Right. So, right. Know, so remember why we do what we do. Um, and, and, you know, so, so some of that, uh, what I have found, the the lessons that I've taken away, um, that I'm my best self as a leader when I can show up um, authentically and unapologetically. Yes, I love that. I love that. And it it speaks to being able to be humble, open, and transparent, mm-hmm. right? In identifying the areas where you know that you excel, where you know that you shine, but also being very aware of what your blind spots are. Yes. So that you don't get caught out there or get caught in a place that makes you uncomfortable, but instead you embrace the uncomfortable Mm -hmm. to get to your better self. I don't know if that makes sense, but that is kind of what what I I am hearing you share. Yes. And and that's so important because I don't try to position myself as an expert on everything. You know, Mm -hmm. um, I know what I know and I'm uncomfortable. I am very comfortable letting people around me who do have those expertise in the areas of my blind spots know what they know. And, um, and, and the humility comes in from, from being willing and open to learn from others. And, um, and the confidence comes in and speaking up when you know you are the expert at the table on a subject and 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 sharing and giving from your expertise 100% mm-hmm. and i think that that's a great kind of segue into our next question because when we are talking about <clears throat> understanding your blind spots right but also understanding how to connect with people who know perhaps in that area where you lack. Mm -hmm. I like to call those folks as sponsors or allies Mm -hmm. who genuinely will come alongside you to help you to continue to grow, um, to help sharpen your saw because they see your potential. They Mm -hmm. see how hard you work. They're aware of your work ethic and they genuinely want to see you excel. So I'd love if you could just share a little bit about what does it look like to find an ally that will help you to grow and succeed within an organization? What would be some of the attributes that you would be looking for? I would say it, particularly in my early career where Mm -hmm. allies showed up and, and in the most meaningful and impactful ways is that they were individuals who pointed me out and they said, you know, I think you have something to offer to this committee or to mm-hmm. this group, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and let me tell you, it, a lot of times my allies did not look like me. Come on. Um, <laughs> yep. they did not, you know, um, when I think about the first woman 
that came to me on campus. She was a white woman and she said, we want you to join our women's group. And she was, talk about open, honest, transparent. She said, we do not have any women of color and I have watched you and I'm not asking you because you're a woman of color because there mm-hmm. are others on this campus. I'm asking you because I've, I've heard your voice and I think you have something to offer. Oh, I love that. And I was a first year residence hall director and I am, or oh, second year, one. And here I am, I go to this first meeting and I'm sitting in a room with like directors and deans and I'm I'm here, you know? (laughs) But um, I did, I I underestimated myself. Mm -hmm. And um, so this person was an encourager. This person said, you know, you add value at this institution and therefore, I you add value in this space with this committee, and um, we can help you advance your career. But you can help us understand our students. You're closer in age to them than we are. Yeah, we're diversifying as an institution. You have a frame. Not asking you to speak for any one race, two races, you know. But but you can enlighten us. And if you would take that on, you know, um, and so I really appreciated that framing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, an ally sees your potential, mm-hmm. sees your present expertise, not just what you could be, but they see what you are yeah. and they see where it has value. Um, and a sponsor is a person that's really positioned to open that door for yep. you. And yes. so my first, when I finished my graduate degree, you know, my, my ally slash sponsor was actually a white male and he was in a senior leadership position on campus and his son and I were in um, graduate school together. So mm-hmm. he knew me from just from our friendship, our classmate, you know, banter and friendship and hanging out. And so he got to know me through through that way. And then it was coming time for graduation. And he said to me, so do you need help, you know, getting a position on campus? And I said, I absolutely do need help. For right. A position, you know, and he said, well, we want we like homegrown around here. We want to keep you here at the university. He said, you know, I, I know of two positions. I'd be happy to put in a good word for you. And one was assistant to the uh, vice president for business and finance. And the other was a residence hall director. Okay. And, you know, and and I was like, oh my God, like, ooh, <laughs> like, <laughs> what hey. do I, I, and I could think about, because I used to, um, I did all kinds of jobs before I, I, you know, um, came to school. I I even worked on Wall Street for a time. I thought I wanted Mm -hmm. to major in business. So I said, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe this, this business and finance thing. Um, And and I thought about it and I talked to a few, you know, mentors and I said, said, you know, I'm not interested in budgets. So, you know, (laughs) Oh man, I could agree. I I am laughing because I am a business major too. <laughs> and when push came to shove, I was like, no, nah, this is not for me. <laughs> yeah, I love people. You know, mm-hmm. I love being around people. I love helping people, you know. Uh so I went the residence hall route. And some people thought I was crazy because the the price, the money, the salary was a huge difference. Right. You know. So, right. <laughs> salary was a huge difference um and but I chose the route I chose you know I chose the 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 road less traveled Mm -hmm. and um and I uh no regrets I learned so much in residence life I mean I learned some of everything I believe that is why I've had all the different roles that I've had in Mm -hmm. education because you really are a generalist. Yes, you are. <laughs> you are. Yes, you are. When you live where you work, when you have uh, that constant connection to the students, it really does change the way you see things mm-hmm. from 
all angles within higher education, right? Because they come into the residence halls and they come in one way and they leave grown, right? They and do. so they to do. me, the biggest blessing in that was in some way, shape or form, that I think that's where our ability to strategize, especially mm -hmm. as it comes to a, a season in their life where they are so impressionable, mm -hmm. um, we get the opportunity to help mold that. And I don't take mm -hmm. that lightly. Like yes. that is such an opportunity. Yes. Um, so I love, I loved, I loved residence life. And then when it was time for me to get married, my husband was like, I'm glad you love it, but I'm not trying to live in the residence. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I kind of had the shift, but um, <laughs> but it's definitely one of the things that I carry with me as a badge of honor because to be able to see my students now as they have grown, gotten yes. married, they have doctors family. and lawyers yes. and parents and yes. oh yes. God, yes. And <laughs> you've been able to be a part of that. You know, earlier in our conversation, you talked about legacy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that when we go into residence life, we start thinking in terms of legacy. But man, when you look back, it's like, wow, what an opportunity um, to be able to serve in that way. What an opportunity to be able to offer options, coach people through all kinds of experiences so within true. the residence hall. It's so true. It's so true. Touches but, on your humanity too. Yes, yes. Um, and also as women of color, it helps us to bring a different flavor to the table. Mm -hmm. I think that because, because we've gone through all of those experiences, when we are able to sit at a table where we're making decisions, where we can now be allies or sponsors for other people, we can, we can kind of go back to what we experienced with our students to be able to help them grow or exactly. open doors for others. Exactly. And it, and, you know, um, it's interesting because when I told you I made that transition out of retail uh, management, um, I had a, uh, while I was still there, I had a woman boss and she, she used to crack me up. She was this feisty, like uh -huh. four foot nine, if that, yep. was a funky <laughs> Italian woman. And she had such a mouth. Oh my God. But she would walk through uh, uh, whenever we'd be in a panic over her. Oh, the sale isn't this and this floor. And she goes, We're not saving lives here, people. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and and like to just and it, okay, context. You know, this right. is not the emergency room. Bring it down a notch, you know. Right. But it's so funny because when I decided to make the transition back, I said, Well, I'm leaving because we're not saving lives here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> But, but when I got back into residence life, I remember my first incident mm -hmm. on duty. Mm -hmm. I, just, I was a new hall director, just come through this intense training and every, I show up at this incident. I could, it was my first, my first month on the job and I got a call, call to a suicide attempt. Oh. Everything I was taught not to do in training, I did because, mm -hmm. um, with this particular student, she had um, cut her her wrist. I'm down on the floor, blood all over her, blood all over me. For, forgive mm. me for some that maybe I hope not to trigger anyone, but I'm just right. trying to give a visual. I'm trying to stop the like I'm a paramedic. I never, I'm not a paramedic. Right. I'm not one on TV, but you couldn't tell me at that moment. My, right. my <laughs> urge was to save this yes. life, this young life who obviously was in so much pain yeah and that was my introduction into higher education so I have seen some of everything into the students that have gone through every institution that I have worked in mm -hmm. and what I can tell you is that higher education plays a role in impacting people's lives and we can be powers of good Yes. And change lives for the better. Or we can choose to put up barriers, um, not be vulnerable, not be authentic, be become bureaucrats and, and lose a sense of self. Mm -hmm. You can be in the bursar's office 
and 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 a business professional, but you got to have a heart. You right. got to know how to talk to students. You could be, you don't have to be in res life with student affairs to connect with students and make an impact and make students feel yes, ma'am. And leave your space feeling good. Like, you know, this person, they could have come in angry, frustrated, mm-hmm. upset, sad, mm-hmm. you know, but you have an opportunity to touch their lives and change their day and really turn it around. Absolutely. And we, we can't underestimate that. I think in no matter what area we work in. Um, in higher education. 100%. One of the things that I used to tell my team was our responsibility is to help people feel seen, valued, and heard. Um, oh, yeah. Seen, valued, and heard because for many of them, especially first-generation students or Black and Brown students, mm-hmm. no one has taken the time to really see them where they're at, meet them where they're at, yes. hear what their concerns are from a genuine place, and then make them feel valued in that you're not crazy. Yes. But you're also not alone. Um, right. And I think that one of the biggest parts to be able to keep that principle of seen, valued, and heard was this, it had to start with me because I had to be able to help my team see, feel seen, valued, and heard so mm. that they mm-hmm. could then understand what it meant to have a family feel seen, valued, and heard. Does that make yes. sense? Oh, it makes complete sense. But you and had so, to know who you were. Yeah. To be able to do that. And, and, and we're all at different stages on this journey of self-awareness. Right. Right. Um, and there are some things I think about, you know, my first meeting as a supervisor, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I'm been 25, 26, and I'm standing in front of this staff. I just assumed leadership of this mm-hmm. residence space. And I had a staff of six professionals and like um, 30 student staff. And it's my first meeting to address them all. And I was so nervous. I was so nervous because they had this beloved supervisor who had been yeah. there for a number of years they loved him he loved them he was an awesome guy I knew him and when they told me that I was going to fill in after him I said oh no yes. <laughs> I'm going behind him. They, love him. they won't love me I'm nothing like him yes and um What the great thing was is that I don't even know I don't know if it was instinct I don't know if it was someone drop this into my spirit. I don't know if it was God. I don't know what it was, but I know at that meeting when I showed up, I something just tell them who you are, be who you are and tell them who you are mm-hmm. and, and, and understand empathy, understand how they feel. They just yeah. lost someone that they loved, loved, right. Loved. Right. And, and I, and, and my first speech was I am so happy to be here. It is an Mm -hmm. honor and it is a privilege. And I think Carlisle was his name. So if he Mm -hmm. listens, I think Carlisle is an amazing person. Known him for years. We have high regard and esteem for each other. Mm -hmm. I know how much you loved him. I know this is a shock to you because you didn't expect that he would ever get promoted and leave, but he's been promoted. He left and we cheer him on. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this is some major announcement, but I am not Carlisle. <laughs> right. <laughs> I said, um, I'm I'm not like Carlisle, but Carlisle likes me and I like Carlisle. And I think you like me if you just get the chance to know me mm-hmm. and I like you and then I will get the chance to know you. And um, I won't be like Carlisle, but you will find in me a person who values you Yes. who will give you a voice, who cares about you, cares about your families, what's important to you, and who really, really wants this to work. So I hope you give me a chance. Yes, mm-hmm. that is awesome. That is awesome. So my last question to you, kind of talking through these kind of points that we talked about, I'm pretty sure you hit on imposter syndrome at some point. <laughs> And that's face said it all. Oh. 
<laughs> so I'd love for you to kind of share in these last couple of minutes, what would be some of the tactics or some of the um, advice that you would give a woman who is perhaps the first to be in a leadership role or perhaps the first of her kind, if you will, um, mm -hmm. in, in the places and spaces within higher education where she's called to, where imposter syndrome could be messing with her. How would you help her overcome that? I guess I would say, you know, draw, find your places of strength. Find mm -hmm. what inspires, motivates you and grounds you. Mm -hmm. For me, um, my faith grounds me. Yes. So I would say, go to your grounding spaces um, and know what you know, what you know about who you are and what you've done to achieve what you have earned. Yes. And don't believe the lies because sometimes people will try to make you feel that you got there through affirmative action. Mm -hmm. When in fact, you know what you invested the time you spent pouring over your books to get your whatever degree you needed to get to the space that yes. you are in. And you have to, you know, we're so good at negative self-talk. We're, we're so good at telling ourselves what we did wrong for mm -hmm. the day or what we could do better. Mm -hmm. But we don't necessarily spend as much time affirming our yes. and speaking, speaking life to ourselves. To ourselves yep. And so you have to be intentional. I've learned for me, I've had to be intentional when those thoughts start to creep up that say you don't belong here. Mm. Um, I have to, to make an, an intentional effort to push those thoughts down and remind myself who I am and what I've done to earn a seat at this table. And you have yes. to believe it before you can sell it. Absolutely. So if you don't believe that you belong there, you are not going to project confidence. Right. And the minute people see that you aren't confident, they have found the chink in your armor mm -hmm. and they will use your doubt to sow further. If they're an insecure person who's not self-aware and of, of, of that, that they don't have to envy you and wonder how you got your seat at the table because right. their focus should really be on themselves. Because right. they've got a calling, a mission, a purpose in life. And I think a lot of times when we start um, take paying too much attention to others, it's because we don't really believe in our heart that we mm. have a calling and a purpose and work to do. So because I don't believe that, I'm going to spend all my time over here trying to make you doubt why you are at the table. But that's yeah. a broken person. So you can't listen to broken people. You can't let broken people speak into your life. Right. And in the areas that you're broken, seek healing. Find, mm. once you've got your grounding, you know, um, if you have this deepening sense of insecurity, I'm a firm believer in counseling and therapy. Find the root cause of it. Yeah. Because this journey to self-awareness is just that, a journey. Right, right. And you surround yourself with, positive people who are also going to speak life into you mm -hmm. you know find the people who recommended you for these roles to sometimes have coffee with them and just say hey i'm i'm be honest i'm having some doubts i'm you know i've had a few projects and i'm not aware you know i feel like you know we we, we want to come in and we want to know everything the minute we get there we feel yep. especially as women of color we yep. got something to prove i have to show all these people that i deserve to be here right you know no, you don't. You got the job. You you can stop interviewing. You can stop right. auditioning. You can you stop know? performing, right? Because we get to this place right. where we have to perform. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, no, no, reject all of that. Reject all of that. And um, give yourself the time to figure out your new environment. Um, you know, there's a great insight that my mentor gave me about mm -hmm. being in these spaces where I feel like I, I need to speak up and show everybody in the room how smart I am. Yeah. You know, um, because I have some assumptions about how they see me as a woman of color. Yeah. You know, or I have some assumptions about how I need to communicate. So I, I'm always worried about how I'm going to be perceived. Yeah. You know, um, but use wisdom and discernment in the, in meetings. You know, always ask yourself, she would say, three questions before you open up your mouth. 
Does it need to be said? Mm-hmm. Does it need to be said now? Does it need to be said by me? Mm. And that has saved me when I listen to it. Saved mm-hmm. me from a lot of of self inflicted wound or wounds. Right. Um, but I also acknowledge my own blind spots. And sometimes when I feel that the perceptions are are detrimental or negative, my ego surfaces. Mm-hmm. And I have had to learn to not let ego rule that I have to prove, you know, because it's my ego. I'm, I'm about to show off right now. I'm going to show you yeah. how much I do know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> You're going to get all this education that I got. You're going to get all of it today, whether you wanted it or not. You right. Know? <laughs> right. That's so good. That's so good. So the three questions were, does it need to be said right now? No. Does it need to be said? Does okay. it? Everything doesn't need to be said. Right. Mm-hmm. Come on. Yeah. Does it need to be said now? Okay. And then thirdly, does it need to be said by me? Mm. Um, you know, when we, we go back to the term allies, when we think about the term ally in the true DEI sense, um, I've learned in a DEI space, mm-hmm. a, a true ally in, in cabinet and in meetings I mean, someone other than me needs to speak up for students of color. Yeah. So, or whatever my marginalized identity is, yeah. it's it not just because it's tiring and taxing to always be the voice and the person, mm-hmm. but because mm-hmm. if we all buy into this notion of equity and inclusion and that diversity adds value and we all articulate that, then I should not be the one that is the only voice at the table that Correct. is speaking up on behalf of, of against injustice and, and in support of. So so in a true world of allies, um, um, a really good ally um, steps up and, and they're that voice at the table against injustice and yeah. students yeah i love that i love that thank you so much for that because i i think that as people listen to this they'll start to wonder like well i'm that person for for some of them they may be that dei person mm-hmm. and feel like they have to be the ones all the time but that's not necessarily true if dei is really what the goal is at whatever place and space you're in when i was a chief diversity officer i would say my job is to train is to train you all so that I work myself out of this job. So there's no need for a CDO because right. everybody will understand that this is the work of all of us and yeah. not the work of, of just one, one of individual. Us. Yes. Right. So if I'm doing my job right, then then you're you're getting more comfortable speaking mm-hmm. up and speaking out on behalf of whatever you know the the mar- the marginalized or oppressed identity is that is on on your campus yeah that's so good well thank you so much dr shay so we've reached the end of our time and i want to be respectful of your time so any last kind of encouraging words that you want to leave for for the audience Hmm. yeah I, i guess what i would say is this um there's a this is a time in higher ed where a lot of people are getting burnt out asking you know, is this really for me? Is this, is this job? Is this space? You know, this is hard, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, the work is so important. We need good people in this work. Um, as you build and think about becoming more self-aware, more authentic, showing up in, in spaces and places, I would say, you know, not just to practice self care, but practice soul care. Oh, that's so good. You know, take care of your heart and your mind. Mm-hmm. Protect those. So when I said earlier, not everything has to be said. I'm essentially saying, pick your battles. Yeah, you know, in my holy text, there's a scripture that says, "Don't throw pearls to swine." Yep. 
not everybody's worth your pearls. Girl, hold on to your pearls. Come Touch on. your pearls. Yeah. <laughs> Be free with your pearls. You don't need to toss your pearls. Not everybody's yes. worth it. Yes. So learn, and that doesn't mean I'm devaluing their humanity. What I'm saying is they may just not be at a space and place where they're able to receive what you're trying to say. So yes. don't get yourself all worked up and get yourself in trouble trying to, to give wisdom to people who are just not at a place of receiving it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways you engage in soul care mm -hmm. is that you just say, mm, no, I'm going to hold these pearls. I'm going to hold on these pearls right here. Right. right. You know? And and take care. Just take care of your heart and your in your mind. Guard your heart. Guard your yes. mind. They are truly both the wellsprings of life. Of life. Yes, I love that. I love that. Thank you so so much. That was so good. Mm -hmm. So I hope people are paying attention. I hope they took some notes because you were dropping some gems as we were talking <laughs> today. <laughs> so thank you so so much. Um, it's really been my honor and my pleasure to be able to have this conversation with you today. Mine too, Susan. It was so lovely hearing more about you. And um, I, I hope the conversation continues.